Yes, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Yvonne hartz Petro, Director of Public Affairs at the International Fertilizer Association, and it is my great pleasure today to moderate the second webinar of this new uh, Plant Nutrition Innovation Series um, co-organized by the FAO and the International Fertilizer Association. And it is, by the way, also, a, a, again, a, a privilege and honor to have with us uh, Dr. Cha, Director of FAO's Plant Production and Protection Division. But before we start, let me just briefly remind you of a few housekeeping rules. The whole webinar will be held in English, but interpretation is available in Arabic, Chinese, and French. And uh, you can find it, by the way, um, at the bottom bar um, on your screen. During the webinar, if you have specific questions um, for any of our panelists, please write them um, in the Q&A box and preferably be not in the chat box. Um, again, um, the Q&A box is, um, is, is important here because otherwise we get questions to both. So Q&A box. And the webinar is also recorded. And if you would like to watch it again, of course, you can review it um, from FAO channels um, on YouTube. Today, we will take a closer look into one of the most important sources for plant, uh, human, and animal health, water. Currently, agriculture accounts for about 70% of all withdrawals from fresh water worldwide. And this makes climate change impacts and water scarcity one of the major concerns for agriculture. Actually, we, when we talk about ensuring future global food and nutrition security, well, this is very much a question of improving on-farm water management. Much of the extraordinary growth in agricultural productivity achieved during the, uh, the past 50 years has been powered by applying plant nutrients and, um, and increasing irrigation from surface water and groundwater sources. And what we will see also today is how closely water and fertilizer management are linked. The process actually of nutrient uptake, nutrient accumulation or nutrient depletion is very much related to transport processes in water. And we will hear today how fertigation can help sustainably grow more food in changing climates. Our eminent speakers, by the way, from the research and private sector will explain what fertigation exactly is, how it works and how it can be optimized. And we will also learn about the variety of high performing technologies and best management practices that exist to help farmers around the world make use of fertigation methods um, and make, uh, sorry, make better use actually of fertigation methods. And now it is my great pleasure and, um, and really an honor to hand over the microphone to Dr. Zhang Yang Chia, the director of FAO's Plant Production and Protection Division, who will inaugurate our event today. Dr. Chia, the micro is yours. Okay, and thank you very much, Ivana, the facilitator, and dear FAO colleagues, and the friends from International Fertilizer Association, AFA, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm really very pleased to welcome all of you to the second webinar of FAO AFA Sustainable Plant Nutrition Series, hosted jointly by FAO Technical Network on Sustainable crop production and agroecology under the International Fertilizer Association. I can see this seminar series have been mostly welcomed by a lot of audience and made considerable contribution to supporting sustainable agricultural. Taking this opportunity, I would like to brief you the FEO New Strategic Framework 2022 to 2031. Uh, this is just endorsed in this month, in last month, in at 42 second FEO conference. The main narrative is transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, 
and sustainable agri food system for better production, better nutrition, <coughs> a better environment, and a better life. Align with this one, I feel now in the processing for support green agriculture. So what's the definition for green agriculture here in the field? Green agriculture is sustainable agriculture that ensures food security, improve human welfare, creates opportunity for employment and the decent work for all without depleting nature resource. Well, maintaining health functioning of Earth's ecosystem in the now and also in the future generation. So this definition and this P now is promoting green production and protection. So what is green product protection? Because this is why, because this is the fundamental approach for green agriculture by producing more with less through optimization and minimization. Minimization. What is optimization? This means optimize a positive aspect, a like structure, functionality, and the service of a production system. <laughs> so what is minimization? This means minimize a negative aspect, such as losses of crop yield and diversity, risk of highly hazardous pesticides, and the usage of agrochemical, including chemical fertilizer and the chemical pesticides. In particular, now everybody knows that we are facing a major challenge for water scarcity, scarcity and the overuse of fertilizer. Everybody knows that. Agriculture opens for over 70% of global water withdrawal and also too much fertilizer applied which they are using efficiency only 30 to 60% result in soil, water, and air quality degenerated due to too much reactive nitrogen. So this collaboration, collaborative weapon series just the feed and the support the need of crop production become more efficient and optimizing the use of water and nutrient while minimizing contamination from a misuse or overuse agrochemicals. It is well known that fertigation is an effective and efficient technology to produce more with less. Although fertigation is not a new technology, but they are now a new combination of technical solution that allow nutrition and water to be more supplied to the crop with a high precision in terms of times and the space. This means precision, fertigation, and fertilization. So optimizing crop nutrition water need is, it is a foundation to obtaining proceed plant nutrition and the high nutrient use of efficiency in fertigated crop system, in particularly for horticulture cropping system. Also, everybody know that this year is international year of fruit and vegetable. FEO urging all stakeholders to place emphasis on innovation to agro food system that improve healthy and sustainable food production and reduce risk of scarcity resource. 
for irrigation is a key technology for fruit, vegetable to achieve a higher productivity and improve nutrient use efficiency. I, like, I would like to take this opportunity to mention that a new flagship publication on opportunity and the challenge for small scale sustainable farming in six UN language will be launched in upcoming September. Dear colleague and friend, the long-standing cooperation between FEO and AFA will be further strengthened the signing of new MOU that now have been endorsed by both organizations. We focus on data sharing and the promotion of international code of conduct for sustainable use and the management of fertilizer. This code of conduct provides an adaptable framework and a voluntary set of practice that serves as guidance for private sector, policy maker, farmers, and the researchers for the different stakeholders directly or indirectly involved with fertilizer on how to be more efficient along the fertilizer value chain. This new partnership agreement with EFA comes at opportunity time to contribute to enhance technological, technological technical innovation for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life in the field's new strategic framework. Together, we will promote a more inclusive agro-food system where opportunities for small holder farmers and FO members are enhanced. In conclusion, FE has made a commitment to transforming food system to make them more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. Our partnership with AFA we should bring this closer to reaching this goal in the coming years. I'm looking forward to the presentation by Professor Mongnia Rassin from Jordan University of Science and Technology. Mr. Dobe Rice, Vice President of Agronomy at Netafim University and Dr. Katija Haras, Research Manager and Specialty Plant Nutrition and SQM. I thank you very much. I look forward very successful and fruitful webinar. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cha, for this uh, very interesting introduction and for setting the scene and reminding us that precision fertigation and fertilization are actually really the three uh, bases uh, of sustainable agriculture and also for pointing to the code of conduct. Uh, for sustainable management of fertilizers, which indeed is, is a very useful framework, uh, not only for farmers and policymakers, but also um, for the private sector. Um, as you mentioned, we are now looking forward to, to our three guest speakers. And um, it is my pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Munir Rusan from the Jordan University of Science and Technology. Um, Professor Rizan specializes in soil science and irrigation, and his main line of research is nutrient recycling in agrosystems and wastewater treatment in reuse. Um, Professor Rizan will talk about the immense value of fertigation for farm adoption. Uh, Professor Rizan, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to all participants. Well, uh, my presentation will uh, go through the starting by the definition and uh, go through the advantages of fertigation. 
with emphasis on water and fertilizer use efficiency. And then I will go through what are the best management practices for uh, fertigation to fulfill and achieve all the advantages and objectives. So let's start by definition. What is fertigation? Well, simply it is a simultaneous application of nutrients and water through the irrigation system. But we have to keep in mind that when we inject this fertilizer into irrigation system, it has to go through all components of this fertigation system. That means uh, they have to go through the main irrigation system, through the filtration system, the injection system, the irrigation pipes, uh, the, the drippers down to the crops. So all these components has to be uh, managed uh, successfully and efficiently and effectively to get the, all the advantages of fertigation. Most important prerequisites for successful... Munir, we cannot see your presentation. Why? It's, it's, it's shared. Okay, try again. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there must be a technical problem. Let's see how we can address it otherwise with the back office. Let me see. We just share it in. in yeah. Maybe they have a problem, not you. Let's try. Uh, Should I share it again? Yes, yes, yes please. please. Okay, let me. Share it. But I think I should have to leave and then share it again, right? Or not? Yes. Because I can see the icon share. Uh, it disappeared. No, it's okay. Share with your mouse. Put it on the screen. Now? now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, now. Oh. Ah, there we see something. No. But it's not a presentation here. You are sharing the screen. Do you see my screen now? You see your desktop. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, okay. That's another presentation. Yeah, okay. Now, now it comes. It is the presentation mode here. Yeah? Yes. Um, can see it now? Yes. yes. Very good. <laughs> yeah, you, you, might, you might want to start again, um, you know, with, with your slides. With this slide. Yeah. Okay, fertigation is mm -hmm. simply, this is a, a simultaneous application of nutrients and water through the irrigation water. But we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, by injection fertilizers through the irrigation water, the, uh, the fertilizers will go through the filtration system, the injection system, the irrigation pipes, uh, and then uh, through the drippers or uh, and down to the crops. So. All these fertilizers has to be a component, have to be managed very properly, efficiently, and effectively to, to achieve the successful fertigation. In fact, the most important prerequisite for successful and efficient fertigation is the solubility and compatibility of fertilizer. So this is the most important one. It has to be even part of the definition. It's injection of soluble and compatible fertilizer uh, with each other and with the quality of irrigation water. So simply, uh, fertilizer must be totally soluble in, 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 in water. It has to be compatible with other type of fertilizer as well as with the quality of the uh, irrigation uh, water. So let's go through the main advantages of fertigation. First of all, by fertigation, we can control exactly, precisely the rate, time, and placement of fertilizer application. We can save energy, time, and cost. We can reduce the soil compaction because we don't have to introduce heavy chemicals or heavy machines into the field. It's also possible with fertigation to uh, apply all other chemicals such as pesticide, herbicide, insecticide. So this will save a, a lot of time, energy, 
for the farmers and increase the income. It's, it's uh, suitable for application of small amount of micronutrients. As you know, we apply a few amount of uh, micronutrients to one dunum or one hectare. So no way we can distribute these uh, efficiently or homogeneously to uh, a large area such as hectare or dunum. So the best way is to do it through the fertigation uh, system. Again, we have, we can, uh, with fertigation, uh, work in, in a wet uh, field uh, whenever the plant canopy cannot uh, uh, permit the labors to get into the field. Uh, the fertigation is the most suitable for uh, such condition. It's very important for immobile, even though the fertigation started with, with mobile nutrients, but it is actually very important for immobile nutrients, such as phosphorus and others, uh, because uh, we can minimize the contact uh, between the added uh, phosphorus, for example, and the soil, and then we are minimizing the absorption, precipitation, fixation, and this will uh, positively uh, affect the uh, fertilizer use efficiency. And also, uh, fertigation is uh, the most appropriate management uh, uh, techniques for cultivating saline soil, shallow soil, or problem having soil, let's say it, uh, with fertigation is much easier and can, can control uh, the cultivation very, very um, positively. Reduce the water and nutrient leaching below the root zone. This is very important for water and the fertilizer use efficiency. Uh, leaching is very minimum. Uh, uh, losses with other means, volatilization, uh, runoff, all these um, ways of uh, losing fertilizer are very minimum. And this is, of course, will uh, affect the uh, use efficiency. Uh, the, the final one is a key, uh, for sure, the yield and the quality uh, is improved by, by fertigation. And this has been uh, approved uh, by research and by grower practices. Let's here say how the fertigation, they can enhance both water and fertilizer use efficiency. First, fertigation, it will save water, save fertilizer. Uh, then even for uh, water scarce country, water rich country, this is also uh, a very positive and it will uh, improve the use efficiency of uh, these two important uh, inputs in, in, in agriculture. And again, also we can uh, protect these, uh, uh, when we improve water and fertilizer use efficiency, we can minimize the accumulation of some of these nutrients in the agroecosystem, in the soil, in the water, and even we can avoid the accumulation of these nutrients in the agriculture products and, and another in our food, which is very important for the uh, public health uh, uh, issues. But uh, when we talk about uh, use efficiency, actually there are several components for use efficiency, okay? And sometimes there are some confusion actually when we talk about this uh, use efficiency. Therefore, uh, let's uh, uh, define and differentiate be among these uh, component of fertilizer use efficiency. First of all, the first one we say agronomic use efficiency. This is actually measures the yield per fertility or per fertilizers added, okay? And this is usually the units kilogram uh, increase in the yield per kilogram added. But we have also another component, which is the recovery efficiency, which measures the nutrients uptake per a unit of nutrient added. So we can define this uh, like a percentage of the applied uh, nutrient. And we have a physiological use efficiency, which measures the yield per unit of nutrients uptake. And this is very important component, which can only be improved by fertigation, we can see later on. And we have finally the partial factor productivity, which measures the yield per uh, unit of added fertilizer. And this is actually the, uh, can be an indicator for the efficiency or the effectiveness of the long-term effect uh, for the fertigation and our management uh, in general. Uh, let me see now, go through uh, what, what are the fates and what will happen when we apply fertilizer? When we add fertilizer to the soil plant system, they will undergo different physical and chemical uh, reactions in the soil. 
And these reactions are actually affected by all uh, soil factors, such as the pH, the acidity, the microbiology, nutrient management, all other activities. And uh, byproduct of these uh, reactions, uh, they will uh, uh, deliver some nutrients that can be considered an available to the plant. We can call it an available pool, okay, available pool. But even this available pool in the soil, they are not all at the time are available to the plant because they are subject to be lost by leaching, volatilization, denitrification, erosion. They can be fixed back to the microorganism by weeds, uh, uh, can be precipitated, etc. So only part of this available pool will be uh, taken up by the plant, will be taken up by the plant. And this actually is measured by the recovery efficiency, which we have just defined which we had definitely nutrients uptake. This is the percentage that we can taken up by the uh, crop after the uh, application of certain amount of nutrients. Now, uh, even the amount taken up by the plant, it is not necessarily to be reflected to the yield. In fact, some of the taken up nutrients can be negatively affecting the yield or sometimes positively. And this year, there are so many crop and soil factors that can determine uh, the uh, crop uh, yield based on the nutrients uptake, and we call this the, actually the physiological uh, use efficiency. And, and just a simple example, the crop can absorb uh, more of the nitrate and accumulate nitrate in the soil in the plant, but uh, this will not be uh, uh, changed into protein, for example, or into a positive uh, parameter for in the crop. So this is, can be very precisely uh, managed uh, through the application or through management of the time of application and rate of application uh, toward the end of the growing season of each crop. And the overall uh, system here, it will be uh, defined by the agronomic fertilizer use efficiency and the pasture uh, factor productivity. And all these components can be improved by fertigation uh, uh, the best way. Now, the major question is fertigation is uh, water scarce country only, or are pressurized irrigation system a must for fertigation? Well, uh, as you know, if you remember, the fertigation started in 1960s, and actually they started in, in uh, water scarce country, in water scarce country. Uh, so farmer in these uh, countries or in this region, uh, they were uh, given only small amount of irrigation water, so they could not even cultivate all their uh, land. So they have to go uh, to use a, a, an efficient uh, irrigation system, such as the pressurized irrigation system, especially the drip irrigation system, as being the most efficient one. But with this drip irrigation system, the conventional fertilization is not appropriate, not suitable, it's not efficient. So the farmer has to uh, 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 switch to the fertigation. He has no way uh, uh, only to uh, switch to fertigation to inject all his fertilizers through the irrigation system. And uh, this can be, uh, was يعني, seen in, in, in water scarce country. They started in Israel in some arid countries in Jordan. And uh, even we were not having any problem to convince farmer to go to fertigation because he himself was convinced and find out it's much better to go to fertigation he, so he can uh, grow more land per uh, the amount of, uh, of water given him by the government. Uh, but uh, and let's face it, when we talk about pressurized irrigation, when we talk about drip irrigation, the management of fertilizer is ch very challenging because here we are talking about very small uh, soil width area. And we have to uh, dealing with very small root uh, area. The root uh, are very uh, dense in this uh, small area in the land. This is the, zo the zone we are, uh, where we are going to apply fertilizer. So we have to be very accurate not to, to over fertilize. And uh, in, in this small area, also the depletion rate of these nutrients by the root is much faster. So this has to be uh, affecting also the management of uh, application of, uh, of fertilizer. And uh, under this condition, we expect uh, all the time that the actual concentration of nutrients in this area are not uh, for sure are available to the plant because the availability or the absorption 
This is a function of the activity of the ions rather than the actual concentration. And the activity, if we are dealing with a very dilute solution, we say, okay, the active, uh, the activity is equal to the concentration. But in fertigation, this is not the case because we have so many other ions. So we have an ionic strength that will decrease the availability of this and the activity of these uh, of these nutrients. So we have to keep uh, th this in mind. And uh, to do so, we have to precisely uh, manage and uh, determine the best uh, source and the best right uh, rate and the best uh, uh, placement and time of application. And this can be achieved through the adoption of the 4R fertigation uh, stewardship uh, approach. And uh, what do we mean by 4R fertigation steward? This is the implication or the application of the right source, right time, right uh, rate, and right place of both fertilizer and, and uh, water and, and irrigation water. And by adoption of this uh, 4R concept, we are uh, actually, we are going to have an, an, an efficient and a sustainable uh, system farming system because this is the foundation of the uh, best management practices. Uh, by doing so, the farmer, he will have uh, profitable uh, farming and he will have uh, uh, products that are uh, economically feasible and friendly to the environment and as well as socially accepted. Uh, when we talk about for our uh, nutrient stewardship, we have to focus in choosing the right source, right rate, right time, and right placement. What about the right source of nutrients and water for fertigation? Well, uh, the source must be in the right combination with all other uh, R's, like, because we don't have uh, one recipe for the four R's. We, have, we might have one combination for these four R, but we don't have a one recipe because this is a very site and crop specific. So we have to have the right combination uh, with other Rs. Uh, the source of fertilizer has to be uh, soluble uh, with the low salt index. Uh, the source has to be compatible with the irrigation water quality. And we have to consider what, uh, what are the accompanying ions associated with the nutrients itself. Although this is, uh, yani, uh, get with the competition among uh, companies to promote their products, but we have to be, Yani, uh, transparent uh, by explaining what's the positive or negative impact of the accompanying and associated with these uh, uh, nutrients. The feasibility, accessibility, and affordability of the sources, this is very important for the farmers. If the farmers cannot afford these uh, sources, there is no uh, meaning uh, of uh, introducing uh, such source to the market. The source also must have uh, the, the, all nutrients are in balanced way and it has to be also suitable for chemical and physical properties to enhance the uh, fertilizer and water use uh, efficiency. When we talk about the rate of nutrients application, for example, here, if we look at the annual crop, for example, as you know, the growth cycle will uh, go through, let's say, ma major three phases. It will start by very low rate of uh, growth and then vigorous uh, growth rate. And then the growth will slow down again. So uh, actually the water and nutrients requirements are uh, and it varies drastically between these or among these growth stages. So we have to select the right rate that will achieve the maximum biological and more importantly, the, maxim, the maximum economical yield, the maximum economical yield uh, to, to be uh, sustainable for the farmers because the, the maximum economical yield most of the time is, is lower than the maximum biological uh, yield. So we have to consider all these uh, uh, factors when we are going to, to give the recommendation for the farmers, what is the best rate of application uh, and for his uh, site and uh, crop specific uh, situ uh, situation. As, uh, as for the uh, time of application, as you know, the dynamic of nutrient absorption uh, varies from crop to crop and from a pl uh, plant, to, from nutrients to nutrients. Uh, for example, uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus and potassium, sorry, nitrogen and potassium, they are uh, absorbed initially at very slow rate and then they will follow up by a vigorous or uh, a, a higher or a, a rapid increase uh, during this uh, vigorous growth stage and the uptake peak up during the fruit setting, fruit development, just after anthesis or flowering. 
if we look at the phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, يعني more or less, uh, they have a relatively constant uh, absorption rate during the growing season. So we have to take this into consideration. We have to also to look up for the potential of mineralization, especially for nitrogen mineralization, precipitation, absorption, and how they will affect the, uh, the nutrients availability in the plant. And for other nutrients also, such as leaching, volatilization, all these uh, soil processes that uh, might have the uh, big impact on the losses of nutrients from the soil plant uh, system. We have also to consider what, what is the major mechanism of moving. Is it by mass flow, by diffusion, by interception? Uh, this will also determine what is the best time to apply uh, a certain uh, nutrients. Also the physical properties, chemical properties, uh, such as uh, CEC, soil texture, uh, the soil acidity, and etc. As for the placement of fertilizer, in fertigation, we are placing fertilizer very close to the root, very small area. So the higher rate of application might induce a fertilizer's burn, and even they might inhibit the root growth because this is a very confined uh, zone and the fertilizer they have also a salt effect. So we have to uh, consider the, these uh, soil properties such as texture, water holding capacity, uh, the nutrients buffer capacity. Uh, we have to look up and consider the dynamic of nutrients uh, in the soil, uh, the potential losses also in the, in the soil, and the mechanism of movement. Uh, uh, all this has to be considered when we are going to uh, determine what is the right place to apply it. And very important factor is the method of fertigation. You know, we have a drip fertigation places, for example, for uh, fertilizer and water within a very small width uh, soil zone. And uh, we have a different injection system and all these uh, different system, they will uh, vary in their impact on placing these uh, nutrients in the soil plant system. If we look at this picture, for example, about the effect of soil texture on the water movement in the wet zone, uh, will the coarser the soil, the, the, the wetting front or the wet zone will have deeper but narrower, as you can see from the picture. This is here the medium uh, texture soil and with heavy soil, uh, it will be even uh, much, much shallower, yani shallower, sorry. And if we look at the uh, effect if, of the charge of the nutrients uh, and the soil textures about movement of nutrients, you can see here in the picture, in coarse texture soil, the phosphorus, yes, it is immobile. It will accumulate most, uh, mostly in the surface soil followed by potassium, for example, ammonium, and uh, later uh, the mobile nutrients will be in the very um, uh, below uh, fruit uh, uh, wetting front, uh, such as nitrate, chloride, urea. With medium, also it will be shallower, and with the fine texture soil, such as clay soil, even uh, shallow. So we have to consider this, especially when we are talking about uh, sandy soil, uh, we have to consider the pot potential for contamination of groundwater with nitrate or with the chloride or with any, with any other uh, nutrients uh, of potential for contamination. Uh, fertigation can also uh, be practiced with treated wastewater. When we talk about scarcity of water, we usually mean the quantity and the quality. We have saline water, we have treated wastewater, or we have all kinds of unconventional uh, irrigation water. And in fact, fertigation, this is the best method of managing uh, a treated, uh, treated uh, wastewater. Because when we are dealing with treated wastewater, we are dealing with water that can have some chemical, uh, organic, inorganic pathogens, uh, uh, some uh, uh, component that are, uh, or that have a, a big uh, negative impact on the, on the human uh, health as well as on the environment. So mismanagement of treated wastewater uh, it will have a catastrophic effect on the soil plant system and in the agroecosystem in general. So we have to use a very precise techniques to deal with this treated wastewater. With, in our case, the fertigation is the best one because with fertigation, as we mentioned initially, we can control exactly the source, the quality of this treated wastewater. We can control the, the rate of application, the time of application, and the placement. And with this, we can maximize the uh, positive uh, or the advantage of using treated wastewater and minimize any adverse effect on the, uh, on the in, in environment, okay? Uh, 
uh, treated wastewater, most of the time uh, they are saline, so we can deal it as uh, it is also a saline, uh, a saline uh, water. And with this saline water, the management is very important, especially in arid and semi-arid environment, because with, the, for example, if we are dealing with uh, salinity of treated wastewater of one day semen, and if we are going to apply also uh, some fertilizers into it to have a balanced fertilization, the fertilizer may be even the salinity can increase up to two days semen. So if we will continue irrigate every day or every irrigation, so we are going to keep the salinity in the soil is about or يعني, about two days semen all the time. But this is not the case all the time. Most of the farmer, they will uh, irrigate, for example, uh, every uh, or fertigate, uh, every two irrigation or every three irrigation. As we increase this uh, frequency of fertigation, uh, the wider the fertigation, then the higher the concentration of salt in the amount of the treated wastewater or the saline water will be applied to the, to the feed, which is very, very, um, يعني, very bad to the cropping system. If we start it here with two, if we fertigate every, then the AC will be four. That means the first irrigation will be the AC is salinity four, the second irrigation zero, and then four, and then zero, and etc. So, but if we irrigate even every four irrigation, the AC they will came up into seven, which is very saline. So imagine we are exposing the plant in the first irrigation to a water with, with salinity of seven, and the following three irrigation, the salinity is zero. This will have a very uh, big impact on the plant. It will not be able to, to adjust and to adapt to the such salinity because we are going to keep uh, يعني, exposing this plant to, to, to salt, to salinity shock uh, one day and then the first irrigation and then to, to zero. This will not allow the crop to have and uh, to develop its own osmotic adjustment to, to salinity. It's much rather to keep irrigating with, with, with high saline water than uh, and keep uh, alternating very saline water and then non-saline water. This will not give the plant the opportunity to develop, to develop its own osmotic adjustment uh, to, the, to the system. Uh, this is the same thing for the nutrients, especially for nitrate as uh, it, yes but, please. Yes, ex excuse me, you still have two minutes. Um, I'm afraid that, you know, you have other speakers. Uh, if, you, if you could slowly summarize your last points. Uh, I have only one more slide. Okay, great, great. Wonderful, thank the, you. The nitrate will follow the same thing like the, easy, the, the salt because it is highly mobile and highly soluble. Uh, similar to the uh, nitrate and salt. Conclusion. Fertigation is a powerful tool for developing best management practices of both nutrients and water, enhances yield quantity and quality, will enhance water use efficiency and all component of fertilizer use efficiency. For our fertigation stewardship, this is the foundation of the fertilizer best management practices. And this is a site and the crop specific, so it has to be changed from one site to another and from one crop to another. Fertigation can be practiced with all kinds of irrigation water quality. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank, thank you so much, Munia, uh, for this uh, extremely detailed and, and excellent introduction to fertigation and uh, summarizing basically the multiple, the myriad um, of benefits of fertigation and how, how all this can be combined and optimized um, through the 4R nutrient stewardship principles. And now um, our next speaker uh, will delve a little bit deeper into one specific uh, irrigation method, micro-irrigation, and discuss what it takes to increase uh, micro irrigations um, uptake and use um, worldwide. Uh, we, we have with us uh, Dubi Raz. Um, Dubi Raz is the agronomy director of Netafim, an Israeli company that develops strip irrigation systems. And through its 17 years with Netafim, Dubi has overseen large scale projects in Israel, but also in many other um, countries worldwide and enabled smallholders and large companies to maximize their crop yields um, and also their environmental friendliness while minimizing waste and um, harmful ecological effects. Um, Dubi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Duby, your, your microphone is off. We can see your slides. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for that. It's kind of sentence that we hear every day, at least a few times. So thank you very much, Yvonne, and thank you very much, uh, Monir, for your presentation. And I would like to thank uh, FAO and IFA for having us uh, in this uh, seminar. So my presentation will talk about micro-irrigation, the efficient, sustainable, environmentally friendly method of enhancing yields. Um, let's go here. Okay, so that's me. I'm I'm Dubraz. I'm a farmer for the last 40 years. I work in Etafin for the last 22 years. Uh, I did many large-scale projects in India and China, working with uh, many smallholders. In China, by the way, Professor Shia is in Xinjiang province. I had done a lot of subsurface drip irrigation there for four years, and it was in 2000, so it's quite... Um, so I think the world uh, need for food is growing. Everyone knows this, and, and we are there, all of us in the same place. Uh, there will be in 2050 about 10 billion people, and we need to create more food. Um, the resources are limited, and, and when we talk about 2050, so we have, we will have 25 less water than what we, we need, we'll, we'll be short of. And 4 billion people will be living under severe water stress. So these numbers are from the FAO, so I guess they're right. And we have less land in a way. So we, we need to create more food on less area and less water. So as uh, Professor Moni said, we must be much more efficient than what we are today. And how we use the water and land today. So if you look on these uh, graphs, and, and, and it's clearly said actually that, that we are not using it in the right way. So 70% of the water, fresh water, go to agriculture. And from this, only 20% are irrigated in, in the right way. And from this 20%, 77% of it is still under flood irrigation, which is, you know, it's, it's a very wasteful way. And I'll show you in a few things why. But in a way, it, it tells us that we need to, to be more efficient, but use, uh, use of water and, and the land. Uh, when we look on, on uh, most of land uses for uh, extensive crops, we can see this when extensive crops, we mean cereals, maize, uh, rice, etc. And you see it's about 87% or more, 293 mi million hectares. And when we talk about high value crops, it's only 12.5%, 42 million. And when we talk about irrigation, so the, the micro irrigation irrigates about 35 to 40% of the high value crops, of the cash crops, where when we can afford to do it with drip irrigation, it is costly. And just one second. And uh, when we talk about uh, extensive crops, it's only less than 1%. One, 1 and this is where we all have to look at because most of the grains are coming from this direction. So when we talk about irrigation system, there are quite a lot. On, and this is, you know, when you fly over the United States or many other places like the Saudi Arabia, you can see these circles of, of uh, center pivot. So the center pivot is a machine, it's an irrigation machine. It needs a lot of water and pressure, more energy. And the efficiency of the water is considered to be between 75 to 85%. So whatever we give, some of it goes away. When we talk about flood irrigation, I did not show it here, and I will show it in a minute, uh, it's, it's a little different. So we have also micro sprinklers, and we, have, we know how to define which kind of uh, Irrigation method will be right to the right uh, crop and the, the, and the land. So this is drip irrigation. Here we see integral drip irrigation, which means that the dripper are inside the drip line. But we can also talk on online drippers and there's a very big portfolio of, of products that we, that we can talk of. But drip irrigation rightly considered the most efficient way of irrigation today. And let's see how maybe we can do it even more efficient in the way. So from this picture, you see very clearly, this is a potato field in France, uh, irrigated with the drip irrigation. And you can see that we irrigate exactly where we want. You can see the uniformity without being a big agronomist. You see a very uniform distribution of the water. And the water are only in the root zone. They are not like this. When you see it here, it's all over. So this is when we talk about rice, flood irrigation. So we see the water all over. And not necessarily all the plants are very happy in this condition. 
While we do it, there's a lot of gas emission coming also, and also there's a lot of nitrate leaching because we, we push away fertilizer, and I will show in a minute why. So this short movie is explaining about the drip VS flood irrigation. And let's see what are the differences when we talk about. Um, let's see, when we talk about flood irrigation. So you see, when you see it here, there's a lattice field. And then the fertilizer, the farmer is going and spread fertilizer on the ground, like usually with a tractor or a machine or by hand, doesn't matter. Then the flood irrigation comes. And what we see very clearly that the nutrients are going down. We cannot really control where they go to. And we see the nitrogen runs much faster because it's not absorbed like the phosphorus and, and uh, potassium, it goes down. And that's what we call sometimes nitrate leaching and, and problems with the groundwater contamination. When we talk, we talk about drip irrigation, fertigation or nutrigation. So we see the drip lines are here and the water plus the fertilizer are carried away through the drip line and they're going through the drippers. We can control the volume of the water that we give. We can control the, the, how much fertilizer we give. And you see that we can keep very nicely all the fertilizer very close to the root zone. They are not leaching down because we know how much water and how much fertilizer we want. So that's why in this way, it's much, much more efficient than flood irrigation and fertilizer. What we need for irrigation system, and you know, it, it could be very uh, different one to, to another from small holes to big holes, but in general, we need a water source and we need some, uh, what happened here? Just a second. So we need the water source that you see here. And then we have a pump, we have uh, uh, filters and fertilizer tank and some control system. Okay, and then it goes to the field and you see drip plant. This is subsurface and we can see on surface. We can do also have very small kits that are only on gravity. We call it family drip system, but in general, we need water source. We need some kind of energy to run the pump or, or gravity. And then filtration is very important because otherwise we, the, the dripper will be clogged. And fertilizer for sure, that's what, what we talk about. We need good and, um, and uh, soluble fertilizer to, to drive it through the drip system. So this is what we need for irrigation system. When we talk about, you know, I'd like to, to talk about a bit about innovation and about things. So rice is a very big crop. It takes a lot of water and it's a very messy business to do it. This is in India where, where I traveled for the last 20 years. This is common practice. So first you plow, then you paddle, you have to put water, you have to, to make sure that the, the soil is very compact so the water will not go down. And then you, you seed by, you plant by hand and you, you go fertilize it by hand and then you harvest it. It's very messy. What we find out, first of all, we can grow rice on drip irrigation. And we do it very nicely in very nice yields. And let's see what, what does it give us to us and how we can make it much better. So this system, as you see here, this tractor, okay? Instead of all this messy water we saw before, we can see here it goes here with two drip lines. So on one pass, I seed the rice. I don't need nursery. I, I save so much labor and so much time, actually. I seed the rice. I put the drip lines in the same time. I finish the move on the field, I connect the drip lines to the submain and I start to irrigate and I can germinate with drip irrigation, no problem. So drip irrigation really changes a lot. Also with this very simple machinery, but this is in a way innovative because I put a drip line on the, on the seeder and instead of all the messy work that I showed before, we just do it very quickly. Now we work on this for the last 20 years. Uh, all over the world. So what, what we find out in after these 20 years, and now we are very, uh, I would say proud and, and confi confident that we can go for commercial scale. It's not trials anymore. We know what we do and we know what happens to the environment because of this. Let's see what's going on with the environment. We reduce the water amount. We can save about 60 to 70%, okay? Uh, there's no gas emission. I mentioned before that so when the flood, the, the, the field is totally flooded, the, because of uh, extrusion from the roots, etc. there's a lot of methane emitting out. When we do it with drip, it's zero. It's lesser sand. People don't like to talk about it, but rice absorbs heavy metals in certain areas, not all over the world. But, and when we do it in drip, again, because it's aerobic conditions, not anaerobic, nothing goes up with the arsenic. We talk about efficiency. So we, we see that we increase water and solute efficiency by 150% because we need much less water. We got very nice seeds, depend on the right, the variety dependent. I'm not saying it's not. It's not all the varieties, but we do see a lot of um, uh, good results in yield in, in many crops. Just to, to make it a little simple for, for people to understand, 
one hectare of rice, flood irrigation, he emits about 470 kg of, uh, of methane, and this is how it comes to CO2 time, in a growing season, okay? Uh, so we say that one hectare is about two and a half cars when we, we will compare for what happened to the environment. And if we take 10% of the global rice production into deep irrigation, it's as if we take down 40 million vehicles of road. Imagine the impact. How much water we save, how much less gas emission we have. We talk about climate change. You, we know that gas emission is a problem and it hurts for us and, and it's getting war because of this. So moving a little of the rice to, to deep irrigation will, will, will create a very big change. It's difficult. It's a different mindset. Farmer need an ability to buy it, but we, we'll, we'll go to it later on. How can it happen? Another thing that I would like to add, because you know you can grow a very nice yield, but if there's no crop protection, everything can go in vain. And that's why we combine together the thinking of how we can increase yield and water use efficiency and fertilizer efficiency, but still we need to do very good crop protection. Now, when we look at these systems, is it good to make crop protection like this? For sure, the apron creates a lot of pollution, and this farmer, I don't want to, to I want to wish him good health because he breathes a lot of, you know, of poison in a way. And we can do it in a different way. And actually, what we did together with Bayer, and the idea that we, and, and Munir mentioned it, we can take the same system and drive through it crop protection. And then we talk about a very small area. We don't pollute, we don't create any other problems. And we use the system because we invest in a system. Let's make the, the most of it. And this is, we drive uh, chemicals through and also beneficials. In order to make it safe, we had created a very small machine, but a very simple one. And, and you can imagine, you take this uh, can of uh, fertilizer, of uh, uh, crop protection chemical. All you have to do, you just, Switch it like this, you don't smell it, you don't measure, you don't check anything. It's an automatic system, okay? By, by knowing what is the field, what is the crop, what is the, the, the insect or the, or the fungus that is the problem, we give very uh, uh, simple detail and application. How much water should I apply? How much should I dilute it in a way? I finished the, the operation of driving the chemicals through the system. I can rinse it automatically if I finish the, the can. And if not, there is an adapter. I just close it. I take it, put it on the shelf, and waiting for the next time. So by this, the farmer doesn't inhale or breathe anything, and we don't create any pollution around. And it's very, very accurate. And you can use it also for other beneficials. Today, there are much more biostimulants coming, hormones, whatever. So this injection device that can join any irrigation system, we can do it very easily. Uh, micro sprinklers. It's again, what we found out, we can use it for a few, uh, a few things. First of all, it's cooling. You know, this is avocado in, in a very hot and, and dry area. So when it's young, it has drip irrigation for irrigation, but we create with micro sprinklers, some kind of micro climate. And today in some places, heat waves are coming and you have uh, very young buds and everything is going in vain because it burns. So we can use micro sprinklers for cooling in the, in the, when the heat wave. We can use the same micro sprinklers for frost mitigation. Okay, if I'm if I'm um, seeing a frost coming, I can use it all the time. You see, when it's freezing, it's it's it keeps the temperature within the leaves, and so we use the same um, uh, micro sprinklers also for frost mitigation. So with one with one tool, actually we look after climate change. We can cool and we can keep the against the, and we can do also plant protection. The system is there. We can apply, it's like a spray actually. You see the, the kind of pulsation because you don't want to use all the water in one time, so we make pulsation, but we can easily drive through the system, a lot of uh, plant protection, a lot of hormones, and there's a lot of uh, interest and, and success in Italy with the Big Recess Institute and Growers Association because we'd like to take it to the ground. And of course, you can do foliar application through this. So the micro sprinklers, we can play with the climate, we can do plant protection and we can do also foliar application. So again, this is when we talk about innovation. So it's, it's existing, it's not something very new, but the idea how to take it all together and combine it to a good solution for the, for the farmers. Um, how can we, we speed up micro irrigation uh, adoption? So it's very good, it's excellent, but we see that still we, we talk about four or 5%, that's all. How can drive it ahead? And I think that, that it's a clear, we need some external drivers in order to make it happen. Um, it's regulation on water saving, okay? 
its government subsidy scheme, like you see here in India, for example, India, by the way, is leading by far, and farmers are getting from 70 to, to 90% uh, subsidy scheme. Water allocation. In some places where there's not enough water, we need to start cutting. No reason why in California, for example, they grow rice, and on the other hand, they uproot almonds because there's not enough water. So the government has to go inside, and, and also organization like the FNO, also organization like uh, Big Off Taken. If I talk to Unilever, Nestle, all of all these guys, they should be very careful about the way they, re they resource all the products from others. And by applying kind of policy that let's save water, let's make it much more efficient in food production, they can dictate and help also by finance to smallholders that cannot, cannot afford to buy the system. And so this is my message to, to the audience here and question if there will be later on so we can have it whenever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, this was this was uh, extremely interesting. I think everybody will agree. Um, hearing about all the advances um, in drip irrigation, micro irrigation, um, but also in particular, you know, your your strong points that you made about the benefits uh, when it comes to climate change. And now um, our last speaker today, um, Dr. Katja Hora, um, she will actually complement um, all these presentations by taking a closer look into nutrient optimization and the practical aspects of improved nutrient management and irrigation techniques. Um, Dr. Katja Hora is research manager um, of specialty plant nutrition at SQM. Um, she holds a PhD in evolutionary biology and uh, she joined SQM's global development team as a research manager uh, to exchange knowledge on potassium nitrate for fertigation, foliar and field applications. Um, she is also the co-author of the book Nutrient Solutions for Greenhouse Crops and um, has accomplished many other scientific publications on iodine and plant nutrition and agronomic biofortification. Katja, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yvonne. Can you see my slides and hear me well? Thank Very you. Well. Uh, my uh, thanks to the previous speaker, uh, Munir, for explaining that fertigation is a science-based science technology with a lot of knowledge and development behind it. And do be for impressing upon you the need for fertigation uh, for further sustainable crop intensification. Uh, I will build on your knowledge, uh, so I will pass through some of my first slides pretty quickly and go on to some practical examples of how we use uh, fertilizers in practice. Uh, first, just some few words on our company. I work for to give you an understanding of where I come from. Uh, SQM produces three potassium sources from the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile. Potassium chloride is a commodity fertilizer and potassium sulfate and potassium nitrate are water soluble salts going into specialty plant nutrition. Because we use uh, solar evaporation ponds, more than 90% of the energy for this process actually comes from the sun and uh, we distribute our products uh, globally. Now, um, the word chemical fertilizer has been used, uh, mineral fertilizer, we know organic fertilizers. Well, the bottom line is that we have these 19 chemical elements which are transformed into mineral form before they can taken up by the plant in whatever form you supply it to the soil or to the water. And of course, the plant needs water, light and carbon to produce the carbohydrates, which are the basis of our food. But these elements, they are needed by the plants to produce that. And moreover, we also need these elements for our own growth and development. So you could state that by feeding nutrients to the crop, farmers ensure that food contains all the nutrients we need in our food. Uh, Munir showed you the four R of nutrition. And I think the key characteristic is that we think in programs and not in products. Uh, with fertigation, you want to feed the plant and not the soil. Uh, the nutrients have to be directly taken up by the plant for maximal uh, nutrient use efficiency, just in time for the crop requirements. So often repeated uh, daily application is best and they have to match the uh, yield and the crop needs of uh, the crop in any stage. And very important, and Munir told you this, each nutrient has to be in balance with the other nutrients in order to be taken up as most efficiently as possible by the plant. Now, 
of course, uh, there are some statistics and IPA uh, provides these statistics on the website also to FAO. Uh, when you look at the fertilizers which go into fertigation, there's five major sources of fertilizer salt uh, which are suitable for fertigation. And these are the main sources of potassium, nitrogen and calcium, which are the macronutrients the crop needs most of. Also, they provide uh, phosphor and sulfur. Now, these constitute only 1% of the global plant nutrient consumption in volume, a bit more in value, but they are the fastest growing segment in the fertilizer uh, industry. And the total fertilizers are hardly growing globally, but the water soluble are expected to grow on a yearly basis 6% each year. Now, this growth corresponds with a higher production of fruits and vegetables under irrigation globally, because we are still in need of more fruits and vegetables to provide everyone with a healthy diet. And irrigation, of course, uh, ensures a high quality and a harvest security. But with fertigation, you can improve this even further. An example here is uh, Chile, where 100% of all the growers growing fruit for the export market use fertigation with their irrigation system. And you see that uh, slowly over the years, or rather rapidly, I must say, they increase the percentage of water soluble fertilizers from their total nutrient application uh, with 90%, uh, which is it, which it is uh, today. Um, now, fertilizers comes in bags, and I give an example of mineral fertilizers because it's our business, but they could be organic in a bag, uh, just the same. Um, Calcium and nitrate, potassium nitrate are the main salts. Uh, when we talk about single fertilizer salts, it's only one of these salts, so one species of salt in one bag. We also uh, have NPK blends, uh, which contain a multiple, uh, like a recipe of these uh, water soluble sources in one bag. And these are calculated to provide the exact amount that each crop needs. And they can be crop specific or they can be stage specific or a combination on the two of these two you can make them fit to a soil type or a substrate type of crop uh, they can be tailored any way uh, you want with a bit of calculation now uh, the initial investment to attach a fertigation unit to your drip irrigation once the drip irrigation has been installed does not need to be high and it can fit on the most basic of irrigation systems what you need is a barrel where you dissolve these water soluble fertilizer salts in and uh, some form of injection system to feed this concentrated fertilizer solution into your irrigation system. Well, depending on the scale on the operation and uh, the targets for your crop, you can additionally install some pumps or automated injection units. And these are mainly installed to save time in labor for the growers, but they can also be used to increase the precision of the application of your fertilizers. Uh, there's more technology, it's available on the market, ranging from mid-tech to very high-tech. Um, they use sensors to measure uh, parameters like acidity or salt concentration in a nutrient solution, but also very importantly, and I like Munir's part where he explained that you need to measure what you already have in your water, what you already have in your soil, what you would have, for instance, in your treated wastewater in order to know what you need to add with the extra fertilizers. Now, these analyses are currently mainly carried out by commercial laboratory as a service to the growers. And then, of course, on the other hand, you need to know exactly what your crop needs. And this will give you a recipe which you will feed into your software and your calculators and your automated uh, injection units. Now, innovations, uh, there are many in fertigation, uh, but uh, we're not a new science. I started developing more than 30 years ago. So what is innovative now is the transfer of the knowledge and the technology that is there to enable this improved nutrient use efficiency for all farmers. Now, I give you a simple example. Uh, there was a question in the in the chat box on uh, how, how would small scale farmers, uh, technically not so developed farmers, use fertigation. Well, this is an example how you can do that. 
um, the basis is calculation. Right? So if you apply exactly those fertilizers that the plant needs, this automatically will increase your nutrient use efficiency, but at the same time also improve your yield and the quality of your products. So also the price a farmer will get for his products. Well, how you would do it? Uh, start with the measurements, measure the nutrients, what you give to the plant already with the water. Um, then know what your plant needs and calculate what you can supply uh, in mineral fertilizers. Of course, this you can have on the market that already are available, easy to use calculators and mobile apps, but still it needs training and a good understanding in the parameters which you need to enter into the system and know what you do with the output. So in practice, it's usually distributors, uh, the providers of the MPK formulas or the uh, laboratories that do the analysis or commercial crop advisors, which do this calculation for the farmer. Now, by using these NPKs, it makes it very simple once the farmer has this recipe to do the application in the fertigation unit. And of course, you can ensure that this bag contains only the high quality sources of fertilizers which are most effective to avoid application of excess nutrients, which might harm uh, the environment or might harm your crop. So this system will diminish your waste of nutrients in your system, but it will not completely eliminate a waste of nutrients. Huh? That requires a higher level of technology. You can make very good one-size-fits-all solutions per region, per crop with this system. But if you really want to maximize nutrient and water use efficiency, uh, this works best in substrate-grown crops. And why is that? This is because you can catch all the remaining nutrients which leach out of the, the root zone and add to that from the straight single fertilizer exactly those nutrients that need to be returned into the, the root system. Uh, and this is a very high yielding system. So uh, this would be kind of the, the ultimate sustainable intensification of production for fruits and vegetables. Now, this requires uh, analysis of nutrients to a high quality, fast analysis, accurate, um, Often huh, in the Dutch agricultural systems, these uh, parameters are analyzed each week. And once a farmer gives his samples, he gets the answer from the laboratory the next day, including with the recipe on how to calculate his nutrients to go into the fertigation system. So he knows what to feed the plant the next week. Uh, it also requires high purity of water and technical fertilizers because you cannot have any excess nutrients recirculating in this system. Now, this is high tech, is it future? No, for the Netherlands, it's normal technology. And the evolution started already in the 1970s and was uh, accelerated by uh, the government that mandated uh, that all the drain coming out of these systems had to be recirculated. Uh, fortunately, already the science was uh, working on uh, this solution so it could be implemented relatively fast with uh, still a continuous improvement in yield per square meter in these systems, and moreover, a very good saving of water. Uh, the best Dutch growers produce a kilogram of tomatoes with only four liters of water. Compare that to 30 to 60 liters of water in an open field uh, grown to sorry, tomato system. So to the question, can small scale farms implement fertigation? Well, for that, I don't need to hesitate. It's a yes, but you have to know how far you do you need to go with the technology. Because it's only a very small technical step and investment wise from a basic irrigation system to a good enough fertigation system that will allow the farmer to produce a higher yield at a higher quality, which will be, for instance, better able to transport and reduce waste in your further uh, shelf life and uh, transport system further down the food chain. So with only a little bit, you can achieve a lot. And with return on investment comes uh, opportunity to invest in further technology. Now, for the last bit, I'm indebted to my colleagues that give me some uh, discussion points from their own country, what in their point of view would be the drivers or hurdles to the implementation of fertigation in irrigated crop systems. So to start with Chile, uh, there 
the main thing which uh, helped the development of these uh, high quality food producers is that the government supported import of knowledge from countries with a higher knowledge level, trained agronomists to transfer this knowledge with the growers, and this system is still working today. These Chilean farmers travel a lot around the world. Uh, in the Netherlands, of course, the, the government had a mandatory ruling which accelerated the development, but the environment was also facilitating by an intensive knowledge sharing uh, environment among the growers, a crop advisory system which is uh, to the service of the grower, a laboratory for analysis which can work fast and provide prices for the growers which they can afford. Uh, South Africa, there's a small scale farmer there, less than 10 hectares, but these are technified farmers. They also produce for the export market. Their fertigation is very normal practice and high tech. Uh, the knowledge comes from the private sector, uh, combining knowledge with their products, uh, but also commercial crop advisors and commercial laboratories. And the farmers budget for these costs, uh, which go with uh, improving their fertigation and the yield risk returns their investment. The downside of it is there that the free government extension service, which was very good in the past, is no longer available for farmers with uh, tighter budgets. Now, in Zimbabwe, also smallholder farmers, uh, irrigation is used uh, in producers that can bring their market vegetables uh, to the market and get some revenue. Their NGOs have been very instrumental to save uh, time and labor uh, and in, to increase harvest security for these farmers using solar powered uh, pumps. Uh, but the adoption of fertigation is very low because the price gap between subsidized commodity fertilizers and not subsidized water soluble fertilizers is huge. Um, in India, well, uh, Dubi mentioned that I think that's the success story of how the government can, uh, by not only providing uh, money, but providing it in a very clever way to support implementation at the growers level. Uh, this is done through uh, implementation agencies, which are public-private collaborations. Uh, each state organizes uh, it in its own way. And this uh, turned out very effective to improve uh, the fertigation with these small-scale farmers, not only for vegetable crops, but also crops like cotton. Uh, an example of how the uh, private sector can use is our company that provided uh, for free the simple Venturi injection units and showed how with some uh, water soluble fertilizers and uh, a recipe to go with that, these farmers could increase their yield by 50%, which led of course to the further um, implementation of this system. And for the other ones, you can, you can check out their websites. There's a lot of information on that. So with that, I hope I kept my time. Uh, in our experience, yes, it is within the reach to deliver know-how and technical support for these, for all farmers. It's not rocket science what we do it, but it does need education and uh, moreover, it needs support of uh, nutrient analysis capacity. You need to know what's there before you know what you can add. Uh, empower the agronomists, they will translate uh, all this knowledge into the local situation and they have uh, the tools nowadays to do that. Uh, companies can provide knowledge as a service. We organize demonstration, organize knowledge exchange between farmers, which is very important. Customize any innovations in agriculture. And of course, implementation will flourish when you have a stable enabling regulatory and economic environment. So with that, I end. If you want to know more, there is so much information available, both on the IFA website as, uh, for instance, our website or any other uh, water-soluble uh, producers website uh, free to download often so uh, to educate yourself so thank you for your attention thank you so much uh, Katya um, I, I think you completed quite well you know with this overview of, of global practices um, and um, and I would like to move on now to um, to, to to, to our Q&A part of the session. Um, we have still a little bit over 10 minutes. Um, and just building a little bit of what you just mentioned, um, you know, the uptake in um, by, by smallholder farmers. This is also a question that several of our participants had um, for Doobie and, and, and also for Munia. Um, in, in your view, how can small scale farmers um, better adapt 
and use uh, um, the different fertigation methods. Um, maybe Duby, if, if, if you want to start. Yeah, no problem. So what we do usually, we just, uh, Katya said it right, we need just to calculate. So we know what is the area of the plot it is want to irrigate. Usually it's very small. We talk about 250 square meters. And we, we use what we call a family drip system, which is a tank that is elevated. So what we do, we just mix the fertilizer within this tank and it go by gravity to the drippers. And that is, it's very, very simple. In many places, and it's connected to the other question and I can answer it one time. Uh, you talk about cons conservative, how we conserve the soil with fertigation, okay? So the, the fact that you need, the using um, uh, drip irrigation for fertigation, does not say that you cannot apply compost, or you cannot apply manure, or you cannot apply any other system. Only just take into consideration what is the total amount of fertilizer and nutrients you put into the ground and what, how much you really need. Because usually there's a much more than what the plant needs. People are covering it with too much. So I think these two, two directions. So when we say fertigation, we talk about what we call head, um, head fertigation. You can do basal fertigation. You put, basal fertilizer in the ground or, or uh, slow release fertilizer. Everything could be done in a way that will keep also the soil. We can use mycorrhiza, we can use other good uh, and uh, positive biostimulants. So let's look at the holistic place. The fertigation is part of it, but we think on, on all over. Uh, Monia, yeah, as, as you were, do you would you like to complement? Uh, well, yeah, actually, as uh, Dobby he said, that's exactly he described things uh, precisely. Like in Jordan, for example, we have something called uh, family farming, and uh, they are using a very simple fertigation system. They just put the the fertilizers tank in the top of their houses, and by gravity, they uh, this uh, nutrient solution will move to the to the crops in their own garden. Uh, it depends also how much uh, the grower he wants to pay. He can put uh, a pump system and in uh, his water well and uh, improve the, the the speed and the duration of, of irrigation. Uh, it can be practiced by any any farmer, regardless of the size of his uh, farmer, and uh, it, has, it, it can be very very cheap and it can be also very innovative and very sophisticated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Katya, I, you are also a specialist in micronutrient management and biofortification. And, um, and I don't think anybody has asked this question, but, but how does all this um, interact uh, with, uh, with biofortification and with micronutrient uptakes? Can you share a little bit of your views um, on that? Well, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm trying to formulate a short answer for that. Um, but uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, micronutrient deficiencies in humans and what we can do to prevent micronutrient deficiencies, eh, what is called uh, hidden hunger uh, in, uh, in the triple burden of malnutrition to keep in, uh, in, in the SDG uh, terms. Um, of course, the first thing to do is make sure people have a complete diet. So anything which you can do with fertigation to increase a production of fruits and vegetables to something which people can afford to eat, uh, that will already contribute greatly to your micronutrient uh, deficiency. Uh, on uh, the other part, if you really want to target for a, for a region, for instance, uh, uh, where my specialty is iodine, uh, say you have a region in China which is very iodine deficient and uh, you, you want to take the regional approach, then you could add like iodine in the fertilizers to provide to the tomato growers, and they will get a little bit more iodine in their tomatoes, which are grown for the local market. And so, so that could also be a way how uh, fertigation could uh, add some flexibility in your biofortification. Rather than to have a blanket fortification program, you take it region by region for instance. And of, of course, most of the nutrients that the plants need, like iron and zinc, we also need. So uh, fertigation is an excellent tool to provide the plants with what they need to provide it for us. 
Thank you, Katya. Um, I just would like to follow up because there was also one question who um, one person was asking about, you know, calcium, phosphorus and magnesium. Can this mix together into drip application? Um, maybe this is a question for, for Duby. We are trying not to mix. We, we call it tank A and tank B. So if you mix uh, phosphorus with calcium, you can block your um, drippers. So we prefer to do it in, in different tanks. Uh, this is uh, in general. Uh, but there are many uh, fertilizer, and, and Katya can, can say that I already have inside a soluble fertilizer that are in other ingredients already over there. So if you're using very specific uh, calcium and phosphorus, please don't mix it together. This is there. And also, uh, sulfur with the uh, with phosphorus are not going together. They will block your drip lines, so it needs to be taken care of. And and I may add up to that. It's a concentration effect. The more you concentrate your solution, the bigger these uh, incompatibilities will get. So uh, once you uh, adapt your fertilizer solution to the salinity level that the plant will accept, then you will don't have to bother about these uh, incompatibilities so much anymore. It mainly concer concerns the, co the concentrated nutrient solutions where you have to take care. And in Jordan, for example, uh, the growers, uh, they are commonly using uh, three tanks, uh, like A, B, C. They put A and B, uh, the different fertilizers that are not compatible with each other. And the tank C is just for acid, for uh, acidification and for manipulation of the pH. Yeah. So th this can be very easily uh, managed by the farmers. I even saw a system where a farmer had a separate concentrated tank for each and every single fertilizer and he used a very simple volumetric dosing approach based on like a, a, a toilet bowl floater uh, system to dose the, the different ingredients into his irrigation system. So it can be, it, 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 it does not have to be complicated as long as you understand what you're doing. Thank you. Um, we have several, I think at least two or three um, questions um, regarding salt affected soil. So, so it, it would be great if, um, if each of you can also maybe speak about that as far as you have experience. Um, who wants to start? Maybe, uh, maybe Munir, do you, can you say something uh, about salt affected soils? Uh, yeah, well, as we mentioned, fertigation, this is the best tool to, to deal uh, with the salt affected soil and saline soil. Uh, because you need to keep the, the soil uh, root zone uh, uh, wet all the time uh, to avoid any uh, concentration or increase the concentration of salt. We have to manage uh, the frequency of uh, irrigation uh, because you are displacing the salt away from the root uh, zone during the irrigation or during the growing season. Uh, the most important uh, thing is to avoid the uh, the possibility of uh, these salts, which has been displaced away from the root zone, to come back uh, at any uh, uh, rainfall events or at any uh, sudden uh, water coming back to the field, uh, this w might have a very uh, big effect uh, on the on the root because the concentration will be too high. So th that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if I may add, so one thing is leaching. We, we call it leaching effect or leaching. Uh, uh, you have to give a little more water than you're used to. Okay, if I need to give to the plant this amount of water, I will give him extra in order to wash away some salts. And from time to time, in, in a very saline area, I would like to do only irrigation without fertilizer. And I would like to wash away the salts down. Okay, and then start again because otherwise, if you work on let's say a short irrigation regime small irrigation, you will create a very high concentration of salt and it will damage your plant. So we need from time to time to leach away the salts and uh, keep it into consideration. And the best way is to monitor food soil solution extractor. Okay, it's a, it's a device that you can measure what is the EC of the water and you can um, uh, define for yourself what will be the thresholds and you never go up. So maybe I will need to reduce the concentration of the fertilizer because the EC is rising, etc. But it should be monitored that this is very important. Um, I would like also to um, 
you to respond to another question we had regarding um, organic fertilizers. We we heard a lot about mineral fertilizers, but there's also the question: so, is uh, do you have more experience to share when it comes to organic, organic only, or you know, combined uh, mineral and organic fertilizers and and fertigation processes? Uh, yes, I can make a comment. Yeah. Okay. Please, well, first ahead. of all, first of all, organic uh, sources of fertilizers they are containing the nutrients in an unbalanced way. That means there is no way you can deliver the nutrients requirements for the crop by only organic sources. The best solution is to combine using the organic and inorganic uh, sources to make advantage of the um, uh, organic sources, but without uh, yani, uh, ch changing the, the balance situation of the nutrients. Uh, especially uh, under salt affected soil. This is very good to also to use the organic sources because it will uh, decrease the uh, impact of the salt uh, and improve the structure. It will improve the filtration, the leaching uh, of the salt below the, the root zone. For, yes, the best way is to use both in combination. But uh, talking to the organic farming people, we cannot uh, rely only on organic sources because they cannot, they don't have nutrients in balanced way, and they don't have it in a quantity that require the uh, that meet the requirement of the crops. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. So my, for my side, it's, it's uh, very important two things. One is the filtration system. We need a good filtration system because usually the organic. Uh, uh, fertilizer are not that uh, they're not so soluble and you have big particles and it can block your drippers and another thing if you're using already and today we have humic acid and fulvic acid there's a lot of biosimilars that are coming we need to flush the system once you, you can give it okay but later on flush it otherwise you can create a colony of bacteria within on the organic matter within the dripper so it's very important after you apply organic fertilizer please Flush your system, make sure that it goes away from the dripper, otherwise you'll face later on problems. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we are running out of time and our translators will soon stop. Um, but I can assure you that we will be answering all questions. Um, we have captured then and um, I'm sorry for those who for which we had no time for the moment. I think what we heard today is actually that irrigation, uh, micro irrigation, fertigation are certainly the most promising options for the future of food production. Um, but uh, we also heard that uh, much of world's irrigated land uses practices are still not really optimal for efficient fertigation and that a lot of other, a lot of uh, technologies and innovations can still be implemented. Um, uh, solutions exist, but it remain, but they remain inaccessible to many farmers, particularly smallholders in off-grid environments where investments and supports are lacking. And, and I think what we all agree on is while we need regulations, but we need also subsidy uh, scheme, uh, schemes. We need um, we need uh, we need allocations and. And um, a good way of solutions would certainly be to partner up a little bit better with governments, the private sector, NGOs, and to include um, fertigation solutions systematically into financing schemes. Now, um, we hope that you found this webinar um, interesting, stimulating. Um, a special thanks to all our wonderful speakers today. Um, and um, I would also like to urge you to sign up for our next FAO IFA webinars after the summer break. Um, they will be dedicated to nutrient recycling and data-driven nutrient management. Um, this webinar is recorded. Um, you will be able to listen to it again um, through the FAO YouTube channel. And with these words, I wish you all a wonderful day, evening, or morning. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.